Good afternoon and welcome to the overview of restorative circles. I am Corinne Connor. I'm a staff developer in mathematics and literacy here at the IU. Here is all of my information if you have any questions and here is my office phone number. I am a certified restorative practice, restorative circle and restorative conference trainer through IIRP as is Phyllis Brown, who is one of my colleagues here at the IU. Our meeting norms, I'm sure that you have seen these if you have gone through any of the other trainings. Um, engagement is a priority. It does look different for everyone. Please honor all perspectives and always assume good intentions. This last one is uh, near and dear to my heart because we come into this job as educators because we genuinely care about children and it really fits in with the restorative practice model. For your Act 48 hours, please be sure to complete the evaluation by July 31st and you will receive your Act 48. We have a couple outcomes today that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna describe key concepts of restorative practices talk about the restorative practices continuum, and we're gonna apply the continuum to practice and talk about how we can use circles effectively in our classroom. So a little bit about restorative justice. Um, the idea of restorative justice actually has been developed over time and through a lot of experience and a lot of people working through getting all the kinks uh, worked out and really working hard to figure out how this can be best used in classrooms and in schools to build communities and to repair harm. Some of the concepts that we will talk about have been influenced and inspired by indigenous communities throughout the world. For example, the restorative conference was inspired by the Maori people of New Zealand and much of the circle work that we're going to talk about today comes from several indigenous communities throughout North America. The fundamental hypothesis of restorative practices, you can see here, says that human beings are happier, more cooperative and productive and more likely to make positive change in their behavior when those in position of authority do things with them rather than to them and or for them. Okay, so when you're thinking about the idea of restorative justice and you're thinking about your community, let's consider a couple questions here. What do healthy and appropriate relationships look like, sound like, and feel like? What barriers can get in the way of building those relationships and community? And how do we overcome those barriers? So the practice of restorative justice came before the theory of restorative justice and restorative practice. It's the science of relationships and community and the context of our work that we do through IIRP started when the founders, who were both educators, decided that they wanted to find ways to make relational and participation ways in students that are at risk with at-risk behaviors and certain um, it, actually prison to pipeline is something that has come out of this work because some of the work was created by John Briefly, who we'll talk about in a couple slides, was actually an Australian criminologist. And um, he created some of this to be used in prison systems. And um, I think I've shared this before in some of my talks that my husband is a probation officer and he actually uses some of the restorative justice um, ideas and principles in his line of work as well. So with restorative practices, the idea is always to develop community, to manage conflicts and tensions by repairing harm and restoring relationships. 
restoring relationships is what this is all about. It's very important to understand that that is one of the key concepts of restorative justice. So when we're talking about restorative practices, there are four pieces that are very important and must be explicitly talked about, taught, and integrated. They are the social discipline window, the idea of fair process, the psychology of effect, and the restorative practice continuum. This is the social discipline window. If you remember when I described what restorative justice is all about, this is where we want to be. We want to be doing things with people, with students, with staff, with faculty. We don't want to be doing punitive, neglectful, or permissive. We always want to be working towards high support and high control. If this were a session that we were doing as a full day, um, we would actually do an activity here with a social window or social discipline window, excuse me, where I would ask you to think about a time when someone treated you restoratively. And I want you to think about what is that experience like and what made it restorative. So just kind of think about that as you're listening to um, what we're talking about here. And if you come to the restorative practice and restorative circles training, then you'll already have a heads up on some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about. When we talk about fair process, we talk about engagement, explanation, and expectation clarity. It's very important. The central idea here is that whether you win or lose, if fair process was observed, that idea of win or loss, it doesn't matter. As long as students, staff, adults, anybody that you're dealing with knows that they were treated fairly, then it doesn't matter if it actually comes out as a gain for them or if it were a loss. So when we're talking about the psychology of affect, we're talking about some work from Tom Linson. We're talking about the nine innate biological programs that are triggered in response to stimulus conditions. We're talking about feelings, so the awareness that affect is present. And we're talking about emotions, which can be scripted responses that are learned over a lifetime of triggering of effects by environmental forces that surround us. And I think about that fight or flight idea. That's something that is learned and triggered. So the restorative practice continuum shows that it goes from informal, which are your affective statements, affective questions, your impromptu conversations, your circles, all the way up to your formal, which is the actual conference. This is the um, session that Phyllis did this morning when she was talking about conferences. We're gonna hone in on circles here. All of this piece is talked about in the day one of the restorative practice training. Okay, but notice that we think, or that we say, excuse me, that 80% of the restorative practices continuum should be proactive. Only 20% of this should be responsive. And that goes for all of these pieces. We are trying to proactively stop behaviors from happening before they happen. And we're trying to repair harm and restore relationships if they do happen. That is that responsive piece. So the idea of separating the deed from the doer, that's something that, again, is key to that idea of restoring harm and repairing relationships. Okay, always knowing that it's a fresh start after you apologize and after we talk about it and everybody gets their feelings out you no longer want to be known as that kid who did blank two years ago and people are still bringing that up. So restorative practices allow for that unacceptable behavior or that act to be rejected because they, again, came in, restored harm, repaired the relationship. And we want to think about this 
while acknowledging the intrinsic worth of the person and their potential contribution to society. So as a teacher, as an adult, I wouldn't want somebody to think of me as one of the worst things that I did in my lifetime. You want to have people think of you as what you can positively contribute to society. With affective statements, um, you set boundaries, you provide feedback, you teach empathy. And the affective questions are open-ended questions that elicit emotion. They allow individuals space to explore issues in a non-threatening way. They address the past, the present, and the future. They may achieve fair process when addressing change. They're used proactively to explore positive change in behavior, and they're used responsibly to explore harm and how the harm has impacted others. The restorative practice actually has a card and it is like a little card that has questions on one side that you ask for people who have been harmed. And then on the other side, you have questions that you ask of the person who did the harm. These are the questions. It is very scripted. You want to ask this anytime that you have some sort of behavior or something that has happened in your classroom that has caused a rift. Um, you want to pull out the victims and you want to pull out the person that did the harm. And you want to ask these questions. So you want to ask what happened? What were you thinking at the time? What have you thought about since? Who was affected by what you have done and how were they affected? What do you think you need to do to make things right? Then on the other side, this is the questions that were asked when you were harmed. What did you think when you realized what had happened? What impact has this incident had on you and others? What has been the hardest thing for you and what do you think needs to happen to make things right? Notice that that question is the same on both sides of the card, because this is that important piece. Again, and I sound like a broken record, but repairing harm, restoring relationships. That is key to restorative justice. For your small impromptu conversations, um, this is encouraging people to communicate with each other empathetically, always listening to what the other people have to say. You're facilitating opportunities to build relationships and increasing social awareness. They're proactively used in a small group setting that can be academic or it can be social. And they are responsibly used to resolve low level incidents through modeling a healthy approach to conflict resolution. So now we're gonna get into circles. So here are some quotes, and I'll give you about 30 to 45 seconds to read through these. Okay, and I love the fact that George Carlin is actually quoted here. Um, who would have thought that a comedian um, would be quoted in a restorative practice um, conference, but there he is. So we did talk about the fact that a lot of the ideas of restorative justice come from indigenous peoples, people, peoples, come on, indigenous people all over North America. So this is an example of a quote from um, a uh, Native American black elk. And notice that he is talking about the way that circles are connected with each other. So whether it's a family circle, a community circle, whether you are creating circles in your school to be communities, whether they're social or academic, it's very important, the idea of a circle. And we will get into that a little bit 
later. So there are five types of circles. Okay, there are proactive circles, responsive circles, sequential, non-sequential, and fishbowl circles. So fishbowl circles are kind of the hardest one to imagine, especially when we're talking about these circles um, when I'm just explaining it to you in a training like this. Um, again, when we talk about the full day training, you will have plenty of opportunity to actually engage in this work and um, continue to think about the circles and you'll get a template to create circles, create questions um, that you wanna use in the circles. So proactive circles are 80% of the circles that are done within a setting. They, like I just mentioned, they are very intentional. They can allow for participants to take risks as your community strengthens. So the more trust that you have in your community, the better your circle will be because people will be open to say what they really feel. Circles build trust and social capital. And proactive circles include, but are not limited to, some of these subjects, creating norms, community building, course content, and games. And yes, please understand that course content, academics, are part of this as well. You can use circles when you are discussing academic topics. So responsive circles should account for 20% of your circles in your setting. They are still intentional. They address conflict and manage tension. They involve all who are impacted by conflict and tension. They allow a safe place for people to discuss issues as they arise. And they are limited to, or include, not limited to, excuse me, patterns of behavior, interpersonal issues, grief, and loss. And like I said, these can be used when you are in a situation where maybe an unwanted behavior came about and you want to address the class about why that unwanted behavior is something that you do not wanna see. So if you're going to reteach what the expected behavior is, a responsive circle would be an example of how that can be used. So sequential circles go around. So let's say that this is the teacher sitting up here and they decide to pass to the left. So one of the things that's important to understand about circles is that there is a talking piece. The talking piece can be anything within your classroom. It can be something as mundane as, you know, a Sharpie or a pen. I mean, that's not fun, but um, it could be something that represents the culture of your classroom or the culture of your school. IIRP actually sells a talking piece that is a globe, and it's also a squishy ball because that sometimes can help students who are anxious and fidgety if they are holding something and they're talking about um, a topic that maybe makes them uncomfortable then they can squeeze the ball and they'll have something to kind of fall back on to make them feel a little more comfortable. So in a sequential circle, you are literally just passing the talking piece and everybody gets time to say what they are thinking. And that's another really important piece is that whoever has the talking piece is the only person that's talking and everyone is listening to that person but everybody gets an equal chance to speak their truth. So um, again, when we would be doing this training as a full day training, we would practice what a sequential circle would look like, sound like, and feel like. So a non-sequential circle set up the same as a sequential, except in this case, you are passing not beside you, but you are going either across the group or you know a couple people down. Um, in this virtual world that we've been working 
in, we do a lot of non-sequential circles, even though they're not really circles when we're sitting in a Zoom room. So instead we are calling out to other people in our group and saying, you know, so-and-so, I'm handing the talking piece, talking piece over to you, you know, it, now it's your turn. Oops, excuse me, I got a little much there. So some other things that we want to think about when we think about circles, both sequential and non-sequential, um, the fishbowl activities, uh, you want to think about the ideas of equality, equity, safety and trust, responsibility, facilitation, connection, and ownership. So we say why circles? Well, why circles? Because they give everyone the chance because they literally have equal setting and seating. Everyone has the same opportunity for speaking and having their voice heard. With safety and trust, you can see everyone in the circle, right? You're facing them. With responsibility, everyone plays a role in the circle. Everyone has a chance to speak. Everyone's ideas are important. Facilitation is you as the facilitator. You are just listening and letting people talk rather than lecturing, which can build connections. Everyone hears everybody else's responses and they realize that everybody has their own feelings and ideas. And the ownership that comes from this is a shared sense of ownership. That's that social capital that you're building and that trust you're building in your classroom. So fishbowl circles, again, these can be difficult to kind of um, think about when you don't see them in action. Um, these are the hardest to kind of explain. Uh, they're mostly used with larger groups of participants. Um, and the idea be behind this is that there is an inner circle and there is an outer circle. The inner circle are the people who are actually participating in the restorative circle. The outer circle are just observing what's happening in the inner circle. One of the ways that people use this is they use this idea of the optional empty chair. And this optional empty chair allows people from the outer circle to jump in when they have an idea and then they can jump out when they're done expressing whatever their idea or comment is and then the chair is open again for somebody else to come in and comment. Generally, the outer circle is not speaking unless they are coming into the empty chair. It's just the inner circle that is actually performing the circle work. So it can be structured entirely for the observer's benefit so that they could watch a specific process or interaction. So if you're modeling something for your students, you could choose students who model this behavior or expectation well on the inner circle and then your outer circle or your participants that maybe need to just be reminded of what that expectation is. Can also be used for participants benefit by allowing them to share their feedback at the end. So circles are not special events. Um, they shouldn't be viewed as something that we only do, you know, when something bad happens. They should really be, not, it doesn't have to be an everyday event, but they should be something that you do quite often. I know um, in the alternative school where I used to teach, the middle school piece of the alternative school, rather than doing morning meeting, because they felt that, you know, that was more elementary, they did circles. And that's how they did um, their beginning of the day. And that's what we call a check-in, check-out circle. So done as a go-around, fosters accountability. Again, it can be related to course content or it can be interpersonal. Or like I said, you could use it as like a morning meeting activity. Um, there is still specific goals that you want to accomplish whenever you're doing this circle. 
and all your students or staff, whomever is involved, um, there is agreements and acknowledgements that go along with these circles. So secrets to success with circles. So there's several things to keep in mind. Again, these are deliberate. There is always a clear topic and a clear goal that you want to see happen. You always want to set a positive tone. That's how you're going to get students and staff to buy in and believe that this is a trust and a positive place, a safe place for them to talk. You want to keep the focus on whatever that topic and goal is. Sometimes people are going to get off topic and that is well understood when we're talking about our feelings. However, as the facilitator, you need to somehow figure out how you can bring it back to that topic or that goal that you're trying to get to. Um, get allies in your classroom, kids that you know um, will help you out and that are leaders in your room. You know, pull them to the side and say, hey, we're gonna do a circle about, you know, um, something that, uh, that we talked about last week in class. Um, can you help really help me out here? And uh, you did a really good job with, you know, journaling um, about the topic. So maybe you can help start us off. Uh, using silence can be really powerful. Um, just sitting there and having students kind of think about what somebody just said, that can sometimes make a real difference. Um, active listening, again, always important in circles, and pay attention to body language. Now, this can sometimes be kind of a double-edged sword. Um, if you attended any of our conversations about um, cultural responsiveness um, or anything like that in day two, one of the things that we talked about was in different cultures, Sometimes there are different body language. Um, so don't rely as heavily on body language with certain groups of kids. Um, some, there are some cultures that don't believe in looking people in the eye and that's okay. Um, don't take it personally if the child isn't looking you in the eye, maybe they are just embarrassed or maybe that's just not part of their culture. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about these um, circles. So when you introduce the concept, okay, again, you wanna make sure that people understand why you are doing the circle. Remind people if this is new to them that it can sometimes be uncomfortable and you encourage people to be okay in that uncomfortable spot. We call it decentering comfort. Okay, but be upbeat, be positive about the circle. Make kids know that it's, it's fun. It can be something that's really, really powerful for them. And again, if kids are resistant to it, it's probably just because they're scared because it's new and it's uncomfortable. That's okay. Just encourage them that it's a safe space. They can always pass the talking piece. They don't have to say anything. Um, but hopefully they'll feel comfortable enough at some point. So because this is deliberate, because you have a goal, there is a specific lesson plan structure for circles. When you come to the training, so I'm assuming that some of you that are gonna be watching this will be interested in doing the training, you will actually plan a circle and then you will perform the circle. You'll choose what your situational topic is, you'll figure out what type of circle you want, what your goal is, and then you'll actually build questions that are pertinent to whatever your topic is. So here's an example of a lesson plan on creating norms. So this teacher decided this is a sequential circle the purpose is to ensure community members have a voice in the creation of the norms. And then they created these circle questions around that topic. This is another one about respect. Again, type of circle. They could either do sequential or non-sequential. 
The purpose is to create an understanding in the classroom about the word respect and what it looks like in the community. And notice that the questions are very pointed. Think about a time you felt respected. Think about a time you felt disrespected. What does it look like? What does it sound like? How did you feel? How would you like to be shown respect? This is a very common circle that I can see happening in a lot of classrooms. Okay, so when we talk about rituals, it's important to kind of think about rituals more as um, what goes on in your classroom on a daily basis. So when you're talking about rituals, the activity that you maybe want to do with your class is if you get in a circle and then have your talking piece and actually ask students to define what they think a ritual is and encourage them to share out what are some rituals that you share with your family and your friends. Why is it important? What does it provide? And how can you create rituals using circles? I logged or uh, linked, excuse me, a whole lot of videos in here. So please feel free to watch all of them. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of the videos for restorative practice and restorative circles. Um, you can actually go on to YouTube and you can type in restorative justice, restorative circles, restorative conferences. You will get lots of videos back, um, but I, suggest for you to look at all of these. They are fantastic videos. Um, the teacher student circle is probably a really good one for, um, for teachers to watch because you can really relate to the example that's given there, which is a middle school student who was being disruptive during class. And the circle was the student, the teacher, um, a mentor teacher and another student from the classroom. And um, they talked about, you know, how the student's disruption affected the teacher, how it affected the other kids, and how it affected that student and um, was trying to get to the root cause of the problem of why was he acting the way that he was. So I also linked in here the flyers the basic restorative practice um, day one and day two is on September 10th and 11th. Those are secured dates. As of right now, we have them listed as face-to-face -face sessions, but we don't really know if that's going to be an availability or not. Um, if you are interested, there is information on how to register at the bottom. Um, then also the facility, excuse me, facilitating restorative conferences, which is day three and four, are gonna be October 5th and 6th. Again, right now planning on them being face-to-face, -face, but we'll see what happens. Um, these are what we call gated learning opportunities. So you do have to do day one and day two before you do day three and day four. So um, you have to have the whole idea of restorative practices and circles before you can jump into the restorative conferences because they are more intense. And uh, again, if you watched Phyllis's presentation this morning, then you will see that um, they are a little bit more of a lift. Okay, so please make sure that you fill out the evaluation. Please make sure that you um, feel free to reach out to myself or to Phyllis or to Dr. McCusker if you are interested in any sort of restorative practice training at your district. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you soon. Thanks so much.